By God's word, we are delivered from destruction. By God's mercy, we are healed and made whole. be seated. At this time, I invite you to turn to the page of our bulletin that has our prayer concerns and joys, a long list of names of those that we are just lifting up to the Lord, asking for the Holy Spirit of the Lord to uh, be uh, with these individuals in a special way, whether it's for healing or for uh, grief or for protection or guidance. All of these are uh, friends of this church, uh, loved ones whom we all know and hold dear. And so uh, there are a couple of, or one addition to this list. I want to point out to keep the Young family in your prayers upon the occasion of the death of Jim Young and also the Luther family. Uh, Mary Luther passed away on Thursday. Her funeral will be tomorrow at 2 at Hill and Kunselman. Uh, so keep the Luther and Young family in your prayers. Uh, at this time, we'll go to silent prayer for all of these, and then I will close. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you this day praising you for our lives. We're praising you for the world in which we live, Lord, and we're praising you, Lord, for the blessings that you have given to us. You are our creator. You, Lord, are our friend. And through those blessings, Lord, we acknowledge your abiding love in our presence, your presence that comes through us, through just provision, Lord, and the beauty of sunshine and the wonderful warmth from family and friends in the church. And as we enter into this time of worship, Lord, in our community this morning, we, although we are thankful, Lord, we still have many things on our minds. You know our needs, you know our hurts, you know our disappointments and our grief and our anxiety, Lord, and we lift them all up to you at this time, and we lift up many by name, Lord, who are in need of you in a special way to bring peace and comfort into their lives, especially, Lord, for the young family and the Luther family. We're also lifting up, Lord, all of those who are affected by warfare in this world, those that are affected, Lord, by uh, all of the earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, as well as the derailment in East Palestine. Lord, we're lifting up a long list of names of those that are in the hospital or dealing with health concerns, Lord, as well as those who can't be with us, Lord, our our homebound and our military members, Lord. For all of these, Lord, we bring them to you and we ask you to heal where healing is needed, to reconcile where reconcile is needed, to care, to give wisdom where those are needed. For all of these that are mentioned here today, as well as those who are unmentioned, Lord, those that uh, we may have forgotten or those that are heavy on each individual's heart, those that we know we wish had a greater relationship with you or those that we know Lord, that just need to be in your care. We call upon your presence to be with them, your grace, your love to just fill them all with the knowledge of your strength and your power and your truth and your peace. We also recognize, Lord, our own individual need to communicate with you even as we enter this time of community. Help us, Lord, to be true instruments of your peace in this world that is in need of so much healing and so much reconciling love. Help us, Lord, to bring your forgiveness to those who feel caught in failures or regrets. Or Help us, Lord, to be uh, a people that take up our cross and truly follow Jesus in all that we say and all that we do and allow that example, Lord, to sift into the souls of all of those who we come in contact with. Allow us to be instruments, Lord, of you that point others to you in all that we say, in our words, and in our motives, Lord. Make them pure. And we pray all these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Today comes from the book of Exodus, and this is Exodus chapter 16, verses 32 through 35. This is the reading of the Lord. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, or as the Lord commanded Moses. So Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. An omer is a tenth of an ephah. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Lenten season is a time, in, of course, in which we contemplate our Lord's sacrifice and as well as his resurrection. And uh, when we think about sacrifice, we have to think, uh, what is the Lord sacrificing for? He's sacrificing for our salvation. And what is our salvation? Our salvation from sin. So the Lenten season, of course, is a time in which we contemplate the sin in our lives and we seek repentance of those sins. And in that, uh, let us pray together. With that in mind, let us pray together this Lenten prayer of confession in unison. Let us pray. Healing God, we are sick through sin. We are impatient, complaining, and troubled. We love the night because it hides evil and doubt that leads to our guilt. As a church, we sometimes seem dead in our trespasses, afraid to embrace the changes that come with the new life you present to us. We cry out to you this day, save us from our troubles and forgive us our sins. Amen. At this time, will the ushers please come forward with this morning's offering. If you are able, please rise. Heavenly Lord, we bring our gifts to you, not to buy your favor, but to express our gratitude, not to support an institution, but to further your mission. Let us use these gifts to support your movement in the world and not the wisdom of the world, and let them become a foundation to support this community of faith as a center of values that are consistent with your will. May we be zealous in your service, willing to sacrifice for love's sake, and eager to embrace your word in our everyday living. Amen. If you're able, please remain standing to, for the gospel reading. Um, the, the reading comes today from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 35 through 40, and verses 47 through 59. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. And on to verse 47. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father so, wh whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. 
but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. invite you all to join me in singing this song, God So Loved. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son, to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world Praise God Praise God From whom all blessings flow Praise Him Praise Him For the wonders of His love Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son, to save for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now it is well I'm walking in freedom for God so loved God so loved the world bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world. Amen. Amen. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, Barna group, but they are a group. Uh, that uh, does a lot of opinion polls with uh, Christian organizations or churches 
And a few years ago, there was a, a Barna opinion poll uh, which asks uh, people a very simple question. And that question was, uh, what is the words or what is the phrase that you love to hear the most? What is the phrase that you love to hear the most? Uh, do any of you have a guess of what maybe the uh, number one answer to the phrase you love to hear the most? Uh, I love you, right? There's really no surprise there. That, that's the number one phrase that people love to hear the most. They love to hear I love you. Number two, uh, it's really no surprise. It is uh, I forgive you. So uh, it doesn't, uh, it, it, most people love to hear I love you and I forgive you. Those are the two phrases that uh, they like the most. But number three, uh, came out as a little unexpected. Uh, would anyone like to try to guess, take a guess at number three is Larry Parks? You cannot guess because you were in the first service. Uh, anybody have a guess? Number three? Dinner is ready. That is the, the number three uh, most wanted phrase or the people love to hear that phrase the most. And if you really are to think about those three phrases, these phrases, I love you, I forgive you, and dinner is ready, really summarizes the truth of the gospel uh, and remind us of why we are all here as individuals, as Christians, but also as a church, why our church is here, why somebody built this building long ago, uh, over a century ago, and why we are called, or what we are called to do as followers of Jesus. Am I right? What are we called to do as followers? We are called to love and to be loved, right? We're called to forgive and be forgiven by our Lord. And we are to know when it is time to eat, which is a lot of times here at New Brighton Methodist Church. Uh, maybe uh, too many times here at New Brighton. But if we think about that idea of eating in maybe even a, another more deeper sense, when we think of the idea of communion, what the church does is communion, uh, that maybe there's a deeper idea of dinner is ready uh, than maybe just what we receive in Fellowship Hall uh, three or four times a week. Um, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the Exodus, and let me just tell you another Old Testament Exodus story. Well, in this story, God has uh, raised up Moses to lead the people from slavery in Egypt to the promised land of Canaan, a land flowing, as scripture says, with milk and honey, the good life, essentially. And as we talked about the last few weeks, Moses, he leads the people out of Egypt. They are pursued by the Egyptian Pharaoh and army to the banks of the Red Sea. Moses, with the power of God, he parts the Red Sea, and the Israelites make it through that parting of the sea to the other side of the sea, just as the sea engulfs the pursuing Egyptian army, killing them all. It's known as the Exodus. It's a miracle of God. And if you were there to witness that miracle, if you were one of the Israelites that witnessed this miracle, this dividing of this large body of water, it would probably take a lot for you to lose faith in God. Well, that wasn't the case with the Israelites. Despite the blessing of God moving them from their slavery in Egypt and also witnessing this, this miraculous event of the parting of the Red Sea, it didn't take long before the Israelites forgot about all that and started complaining about the situation that they were in. You see, once they crossed the Red Sea, they were still not in the promised land. They were in an in-between land, and it was tough going. It was a wilderness, and uh, it was, they were still in search of that good life, and they were struggling to provide for themselves in this wilderness, and it didn't take long before the people grew impatient with God and began to complain because they were hungry, right? They actually said things like they wish they had died enslaved in Egypt than to be wandering around free, but wandering around in this wilderness starving. But God hears their complaint and gives them the blessing of sustenance by feeding them with what becomes known as manna or 
the bread from heaven. God says that each day he would provide this manna in the fields. It would just be laying in the fields. And he would provide uh, that just for that day, and the Israelites could gather it up to eat. Now, they couldn't gather up enough for tomorrow or enough for the week. Uh, They had to gather it up just for that day, because if they gathered up more than just today's amount or that day's amount, uh, it would become rotten. So all they could do is wake up every morning and gather up enough for that day. And each day they would have to have faith that God would provide for them the following day. But what a blessing from God this was. They were hungry no more in the wilderness. Uh, Exodus 16.31 says this about the manna, the bread from heaven. It said that it tasted like honey. You see, it tasted like honey because it was a foretaste or a reminder to the people of where they were heading, of where God was leading them to a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the bread that comes down from heaven and tastes like the promised land that God was going to be giving them. Now, the Israelites not only consume the manna as their daily food, but God also tells them to place some of this manna in the tabernacle. That was their portable temple in the wilderness, the place where they worship God before they get into the promised land and build the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, The temple, anyway, they were told to put a little bit of this in the temple. The Exodus reading this morning described this event. It said, place a jar with an omer of manna in it. Now, I don't know what an omer is. Uh, You could probably go to your local deli and ask for an omer of bologna, and whatever they give you back, let me know, and then we will know what an omer is. But I have no idea what an omer is. Uh, But anyway... They place a jar of it in the Holy of Holies. So it's small enough to be in the Holy of Holies, in the Ark of the Covenant, with the Ten Commandments and the budded rod of Aaron. This manna that is placed in here will never spoil like the other manna, and it'll be there forever. So therefore, because it tastes like honey, God is calling the Israelite people to place their trust in his ability to provide for them daily, While they are being led to the promised land, a land that will one day be fulfilled as God's promise, and because God told them to place it in the Holy of Holies, God was telling the Israelites that the manna was not only miraculous, but most holy and sacred because it belonged in the house of God, in the place of God's very presence, because it as well came from the heavens. And then the miracle of the manna after that ended, the moment the Israelites entered the promised land. So 40 years, the Israelites were sustained in the wilderness by the manna, and then it ended the moment they entered the promised land. It was a miracle bread from heaven, a sign of God's fidelity, a foretaste of that promised land, and when they entered it, it was over. And as time went on, as they were in the promised land, and the Jews rose and fell and scattered and became lost, as we've been learning about the last couple of weeks, as they reflected on this manna and they contemplated what had happened to them as the wilderness and what had happened to them on their way to the promised land, they began to believe that the manna from the Exodus was not only a miracle, but they also saw the manna as something that actually existed from the beginning of time, since the dawn of creation, because it was from the heavens, and we know that God is eternal, so anything that's in his realm is from before time. Rabbis taught in the synagogues that the manna was reserved in heaven for the Israelites from before the fall of Adam and Eve. So if you think about that, The manna to the Israelite people was the perfect food. It was untouched by the sin of humanity, bread from heaven that was uncorrupted by sin. The rabbis also taught 
that the manna like that that was kept in the Ark of the Covenant was also in the heavenly temple for the feeding of God's people. So it still exists in the heavenly realm with God for the feeding of God's people. And finally, the Jewish people were taught from the time of the prophets and the exile and the scattering of the nations from the promised land all the way to the time of Jesus to expect that when the Messiah comes, just like Moses in the first exodus that ended with Joshua in the Jordan River, that just like Moses in the first exodus, the Messiah in this new exodus would once again rain down manna from heaven. They thought that because just as the Israelites ate manna after they left Egypt, but before they entered into the promised land, you know, that in-between time, so too would the righteous, those who followed the Lord, would eat manna after the coming of the Messiah, but before they entered into the new promised land, a new Jerusalem, a new creation, a holy new heaven and new earth where they would be holy and the holiness would rule over the heart of every single soul forever and ever never to be scattered, never to be conquered again. And all of this was spoken through the prophets. So when the new exodus finally begins, just like the first exodus, God would raise up a Messiah, form together his scattered people, the 12 tribes of Jacob, the Israelites that were scattered everywhere, and would rain down uncorrupted, holy bread from heaven every single day so that the people of God might have a foretaste of the new holy creation that was coming, the new promised land that was promised to them. This is what the Jews thought. This is what they were taught to look for, for the signs of the Messiah. Now think about this. With this background in mind, And Jesus being Jewish, Jesus and his disciples and just about all the people of the crowd who follow him and come to hear him teach being Jewish too, they all know this too. They all know the signs that they are looking for, right? And then comes our reading from today, from the show room. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, When did you come here? This is right after Jesus is fed the 5,000. This is the very next uh, day. Jesus answers them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He's saying, not because you're looking for signs of the Messiah, but because you just want fed from some of that stuff I did yesterday. Jesus continues, Do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures for eternal life. And what is the food that they would understand that endures for eternal life? The manna, like the manna in the Ark of the Covenant, right? Which the Son of Man will give to you. Who gives manna? In the Old Testament, it's Moses rains down manna, but they're looking for a new Moses. They're looking for the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, I'm the one that's going to give this to you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who has, he has sent. Simply, what must we do to receive this, right? Jesus says, just believe in him. Believe that he is the Messiah. So they said to him, what are the signs you are going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe? What work are you performing? So what they are saying here is they need a little more confirmation to believe. We we need another sign. And what sign do they want from Jesus? In the very next verse, they demand Jesus to bring down the manna from heaven. They say, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's them asking Jesus to bring down the, the bread. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, 
But it was the Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. They're doubling down. They're saying, don't just give us this bread one time. Give it all the time. Give it to us. Jesus answered by saying, very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life, he says. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus is saying, he is that bread from heaven. And this manna of the new exodus will be his flesh. And those who eat of it will have eternal life. Think of our communion, which we do once a month here. And then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Remember that sacrifice stuff that we were talking about last week where they took the blood and they threw it on the on the tent, or on the altar thank you and then they took half of it and threw it on the people symbolizing that they are one blood that they are one family jesus is saying those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and i in them one blood one family those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and i in them just as the living father sent me And I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread that your ancestors ate and died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. You see, Jesus is saying that he is the Messiah they're looking for. And he will bring down the manna from heaven just like the Israelites are looking for. Except two differences. This manna won't be like the bread of old that was just sustenance for a trip through the wilderness. But this new manna will do more than just provide us the journey. It will actually lead us to eternal life. To the new Jerusalem. To the new promised land. And it won't be bread in the same way. It will be bread of flesh and blood. You know what manna means in Hebrew? It means what is it? I had a seminary professor tell me this is how it worked. The Israelite mothers would go out into the field and they'd gather up all the manna in the morning and the Israelite children would ask, what is it for breakfast, mom? And the moms would reply, yes. That was a joke, right? Thank you. (laughs) Manna means what is it? I find that striking. Because what is it is a question. It's not a thing. It's a question. And truly asking that question is important when we think in terms of Jesus, the bread of life, or or we think in terms of Jesus in our lives of faith. What is it, Lord, that you are blessing me with today? What is it, Lord, that you're blessing my church with today? Just like manna comes each and every day, not tomorrow, not yesterday, not uh, 10 years in the future, but what are my blessings at this very moment, this very day? What is it that you bless me with? You know, maybe for the Christian, what our daily blessing is, is simply that we are loved and that we belong to a church that expresses love and that we are forgiven and that we belong to a church that forgives 
and that we never go hungry because dinner is always ready. Every day, the bread from heaven, Jesus, is always available to us and for us. As we're leading up to the resurrection of Jesus, in the Old Testament, the Messiah has arrived. The new exodus is about to begin with the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. A Passover a meal awaits on Monday, Thursday, and there will be bread from heaven for all of our journey until we all make it to the promised land. More to come. Glory be to the Lord our God, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us rise for our closing song. Let us pray. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God in communion with the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep all of you now and forever and unto ages of ages. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Amen.